Hello and welcome to yet another amazing two new quick starts just for you. Welcome to Genealogy Quick Start. Have you ever thought of researching the neighbors to learn more about your ancestors? We all know about neighbors. We know Mr. Rogers. We know Sesame Street. Who are the people in your neighborhood? I asked Jim and Michael, which of the Muppets are they? Which Muppet do you think they are in the neighborhood? Today, we have two quick starts. This is how you know. This is how you know that we really have a great synergy here because we created independently two quick starts that deal with neighbors and the neighborhood. First up, I want to make sure that you know you can subscribe to our newsletter. We have a newsletter and you will get just a couple of emails a month. I don't go crazy on newsletters just to keep you up to date with what's going on on this wonderful show that is a Philly Cam show that you can watch live on YouTube as well as Facebook. What are these quick starts that I'm raving about? First off, we have here comes the eternal neighborhood. Yes, we're talking about the burial neighbors. Jim and Michael are going to elaborate on that more. I'm not totally sure about this quick star, but I know it's good. And we have our special guests. Let me tell you about the special guests. When I go and listen to genealogy presentations, there are some who just, you know, great knowledge, but there are some that I just, I'm on the edge of my seat, excited. And that's our special guest, Jerry Smith, certified genealogist. He is a land guru. And today he is going to quick start building a neighborhood to show migrations. And wow, it is mind blowing what Jerry has been able to do with land records and deeds over the past I don't know how many, we're going to have to ask him, how long have you been doing this thing, Jerry, right? How, what, how, do you, how did you get started in all of this? But first, before we get started, you must meet, again, your favorite neighbors. First up, James M. Bidler, columnist and editor. Hello, Jim. Hello. Hello, Shamel. And also... Genealogy tip of the day, Michael John Neal. Hello, Michael. How are Hello, you? Hello, Shamel. I'm, I'm hanging in there. How are you? So have we determined who is who in this neighborhood? Which Muppets are you guys? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm i Elmo, and I thought Jim was the garbage can grouse person, if I remember <laughs> <right>. <laughs> Anyway, in this neighborhood, you know, Jerry's going to be talking about deeds and migration. Do you guys have any, in all of your expertise, do you have any interesting deed or migration tales? I would say that the most interesting de series of deeds that I have isn't a migration trail, but it's a dude that bought property died in 1855 very young his widow got it she married again had more kids with husband number three and when she dies 50 years after her first husband dies there's a series of quick claim deeds transferring title to the property and they reference the first husband who died 50 years prior to that and her children the heirs of the first husband get more for their share of the land than the heirs of her with the second husband it, the reason why isn't stated in the d's but when i looked at it and thought about it for a minute they had more of an interest in the estate because they descended from the wife and the original owner whereas the others just descended from the wife so so wow that's a great teachable moment there yeah. michael because it's not just about grabbing that record and pulling the names off it's kind of understanding why did this person get and this one did not get? Right, and I, the thing I thought about after a minute was, why is there a different amount of money? And it didn't take long to figure that out. But, you know, money answers a lot of questions, also causes a lot of problems. But money answers a lot of questions when we try to get into the details of it in our research sometimes. 
It most definitely does. I forgot to say, hey, whether you are watching live or in recording, where are you? Say hello. We see some of our regulars are already doing that, but please take care of that and we will announce you. Jim, any cool tales from your... Uh, yeah, well, uh, on that topic of money, uh, <laughs> my uh, fifth great grandfather, Conrad Beidler, he, he had two uh, uh, real pieces of real estate in his lifetime. And his first one he sold to his oldest son for what looks like market value. I mean, I think it was like 2,500 pounds in the 1780s, which was a pretty substantial deal because it had mill and all that. But then his second, his second, um, what, what was then a farm, uh, now is a, a um, house in a city, uh, that he essentially gave to his younger son. And uh, uh, obviously, the younger son was, was caring for him in his old age. So I thought that was an interesting difference, market value for one son and uh, for 10 shillings <laughs> and lo love and paternal care for the next one. So you really, you boiled it down to the fact that he was the one who took care of the dad. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You got to come up with something instead of just saying, Hey, this is what happened guys. Thank you for that. And of course we have our wonderful, wonderful viewers here, our quick starters. Hey, TME in Atlanta. So nice to have you here. Hi, Judy from Chicago Land and Fox Valley Genealogical Society. Um, hello, Jean from Collegeville and many genealogy societies. Jean's being shy today. Hey, Gary from Toledo. Nice to see you. Angela in Houston by way of Chicago. Hi, Roberta from Orlando. Paula from West Defford, how are you? And um, Erwin from Delaware Augs, nice to see you. And Valerie Ann, so nice to have you from Genealogical Society of Pennsylvania. So let's go ahead and get going with this new quick start, which I'm very excited about. Like, I love cemeteries. I actually met a genealogist who does not love cemeteries. What do you guys think? I know, like, what's up with that? Do you guys love cemeteries? Put in the chat whether you guys love cemeteries. Jim or Michael, do you love cemeteries or you kind of lukewarm on them? Absolutely love them. Yeah, me too. Uh, me too. Yeah, for the most part, for the most part. So let's do this quick start. Here comes the eternal neighborhood. So you probably should maybe love cemeteries a little bit to uh, do this quick start. So tell us about what is this eternal neighborhood and how is it going to help us? Well, your ancestor lived amongst people that he or she was probably related to either by marriage or by some kind of an affiliation. And frequently, but there's exceptions, people are buried near relatives or members of their, their social group, if you will. So I, usually for genealogy, we're thinking about relatives, either by blood or by marriage they're buried to. There's always exceptions. There's always people that are buried all by themselves for one reason or another. But our assumption is we're going to assume that there's somebody relatively close to them that may be a relative, especially when you're really stuck um, on your dead person. So just one interesting note that um, might be something to look for if you're researching uh, records. I remember like a decade ago, it wasn't like a fire sale on cemetery um, plots, but they announced, hey, they're going to go up on the rates. Let's everybody get our cemetery plot. So like my family, everyone was like buying them. So we're going to like be in a clump kind of like together. And people might wonder, how did they all, is this like the tumor cemetery? <laughs> no, it was an effort <laughs> to get those cheap plots. But yeah, cemeteries are fun. All right, let's get started with this quick start. Here comes the eternal neighborhood. Step one is to pick a burial. So you mean a cemetery or a particular person in the cemetery? Okay. Particular person. Yep. We're picking up one person to start with. Not and yourself. Then step two. 
is to determine the type of cemetery. Hmm, what does that mean? What does types of cemetery? Well, a lot of a lot of the uh, early uh, cemeteries in this company were really churchyards. The cemetery grew up around uh, the church. Uh, what happens frequently is then the church moves. Usually the cemetery does not move with it. <laughs> uh, usually the cemetery does not move anywhere, although there's plenty of exceptions to that too. Uh, so those churchyard ones usually were, um, they buried the people in rows. They could reserve a spot next to them in the row for a spouse or another family member. And then they'd keep on, keep on uh, burying. Uh, so that's one type of type of setup. Uh, then for the most part in the mid 1800s, you started getting cemeteries that were more organized where you'd buy a lot, a lot of four graves or eight graves or, uh, you know, what have you. Uh, and then you had very defined spaces and uh, it kind of, those cemeteries, instead of growing by rows, they grew, uh, you know, somebody, somebody might buy a lot and not use it for years and years and years. Next one over, somebody died early and there you have burials already. Okay. So understanding the type will help you to understand how they're actually placed into kind of like the history of burials. I never thought about it. that Because in some cases they're more, we're not saying they're strictly chronological, but there's a general tend to be more chronological than they are in like the cemeteries in the Midwest where I've got most people that's, it's always a lot of eight or four grays or whatever. And everybody's clustered. Um, there's exceptions to that, but it's more common. But, you know, like Jim says, if it's a churchyard early enough, they're more likely to be chronological. You're not going to find, 10 p 10 relatives buried in the same clump usually right right okay i think that's like an important like thing to think about when you're writing about a cemetery is getting down to i'm always looking for a map like i need a map and i need to know how these things are labeled right do you guys have any good um success with finding like maps of cemeteries well, it really kind of I was going to say, it, it really depends. There was uh, last year when I went to, I went to one in Kansas and one in Nebraska. And I loved it because as you drove up to the cemetery, there was a big sign and there were little signs indicating what the, all the rows and an index of burials. And it was easy peasy to find your individuals, but in ones back where I'm from, that is not the case. You don't just walk up and there's like a, <laughs> any kind of setup like that and they're they're not they're organized but not that one it was very regimented the rows and the spaces and everything of course it's that one was in kansas where it's flat it makes it easier to do that a little bit but uh you know but some you get you may get lucky and find that and in others it's going to be a little bit a little bit different you're trying to chop down the thicket so you can get back there to see your stuff. But all right. So determine the type of cemetery. I love that. We should do a whole like we need. I love that. What you guys just shared. Step three is now to track burials within a one or two stone radius. What does that mean? Using your your target one as a starting point, then go, you know, up and down the row or the lot, uh, and you know, you know, kind of create a circle or a square uh, around that, and look at who are those other burials. Okay. Okay. So it's not just like the person next to him. We're doing kind of like a, a big group. Cause I was like, this is kind of like, like, you know, punk land genealogists. We're not just going to go over one stone. We're going to, you know, do the whole right. like and, an acre. <laughs> right. And you may, you know, I, I can think of a family where there's maybe eight buried together and it's like, I don't know who paid for four of the stones, but it was the exact same, I mean, different inscription, obviously, but the stones are all the same kind of material, the same cut, same font. Um, 
different little time periods because of when they die. But, you know, that's another clue. We talked, the one, the two stone radius mm -hmm. is good, but if they look really similar, mm -hmm. you know, that may be a clue. It's, you know, uh, relatives as well. But, you know, don't ignore that one that looks different because that might be somebody who died a lot earlier or a lot later. And the stone looks different because of the style or the time period. Makes sense. All right. So then you got you and you have fantastic pictures to show this one to two stone radius. Let's move on to step four. Excuse me. Take pictures of the headstones. <laughs> if, you've, if you're going to have allergies, take some medication before you go to the cemetery in case the flowers are in bloom or whatnot. So you're not worried about your nose. You can focus on your pictures. But the nice thing about having digital cameras is you can, you're not worried about film and the cost of developing and things of that type. Take a lot of them. We'll see the ones that we're going to see for the cemetery that I visited. I've got. 20 times as many pictures as we're going to show in the in the spot for a variety of reasons so you get different different angles and get different perspectives as we're going to see in some of the some of the illustrations the one thing we're not going to talk about how to photograph tombstones at least not in this presentation but i would if you're going to travel a distance to do this as a lot of us do and you haven't done a lot of cemetery photographing of stones practice in a local cemetery different times of day different lights different lighting you know different kinds of weather there's some material reflected materials you can get and use because you may drive you know 500 miles or a thousand miles to that cemetery and you might not have the ideal weather and you can't stay until the weather gets better you know, and so you have to just kind of deal with it as it is so practice before you go if you're not familiar with doing that I thought you said we weren't going to talk about that. <laughs> uh, we weren't, but I did try to keep it short. <laughs> All right. So take pictures of the headstones and then st and you're going to show some really cool pictures. And then I'm going to ask you some more picture tips when we get there. And then step five is to perform quick research on those neighbors. So did you guys want me to share your, uh, what you have here? All right, let's get them up. You guys have really good um, examples of your stuff. Yeah, and I, I uh, created mine from actually a, a situation I'm involved in. Uh, the last wooden marker in Berks County is on this Burn Historic Graveyard. And um, it was deteriorating, so a, a local Pennsylvania German center uh, volunteered to create a new one and preserve the old one. Uh, so then we wanted to find out who the heck is buried with this wooden marker that now is completely uh, illegible. Uh, so what we did, if you go to the next slide, uh, we... All, all we knew is that it had a soldier flag from the Civil War. This is a, a uh, compilation of the uh, inscriptions that I had done, oh my goodness, more than 30 years ago. Go Jim. Yeah, yeah. But it, you know, it was unknown back then. And I, I kind of figured this was going to be a completely lost cause. Um, but then... Right after, and we got some publicity for when we, we reinstalled the new preserved marker. So you go to the next slide. Uh, somebody, somebody just about immediately uh, emails us and said, well, it's on find a grave that this is this Civil War soldier, William Stam's uh, marker. Oh, and, wow. and, and of course, I'm thinking, I, th I thought the people I was collaborating with would have checked for right? <laughs> they probably they probably thought i was the one that was gonna check it. oops yeah oops and but but you know this guy was at the, the battle of gettysburg i mean it was gonna wow. be a great story but but you know like picking a scab uh, i i needed to do more research to try to try to figure this out and uh, from this time period there were a couple of pastors who were doing burials on this graveyard so i was looking um and uh, there there's a if we go into the next slide uh 
there was an old handwritten uh, compilation that I don't know by how many decades uh, predates what I did in the 1980s. But there we find this guy, William Stamm, and with the correct dates. And then we also find Wooden Stone died 1825. Oh. And in between them, Isaac Stamm, born 1814, who is the father of William Stamm. Okay. So, so now I am really scratching my head on this. It, it appears to me that that the wooden marker can't be for William yeah. Stamm because at one time there there was a marker for him noted as separate. Yeah. Uh, so then we go back to um, uh, my um, uh, compilation, and if we want to go to the next slide. Uh, well, before we go to that, we find we find that his mother, William Stam's mother and the wife of Isaac Stam, that she died 1891. No stone for her anywhere. Oh, uh, but she's no. definitely mentioned not just on Find a Grave, but she's mentioned in that one pastor's barrow records. Okay. So so what I'm what I am uh uh, speculating, if we go to the, I believe the final slide, uh, is if you go by this burying in rows thing, you have Isaac Stam, the father. I think you have a close up. I, I do. I, 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 I sense, I did. sense people straining their eyes. So, <laughs> uh, he died in 1883. William Stam, the the son, died 1888. His stone, I'm thinking, is no longer extant. Mm. And then 1891, after that, would have been the mother. So okay. I'm, I'm about 95% sure that the wooden marker is that of the mother. Oh. And then, yeah. So, you know, uh, not not a for sure, but um, but something. Um, I I'm love thinking. that. I love yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. So now we go into Michael's beautiful pictures. So. Here we go, Michael. No, that was a great, um, great case study there, Jim. Yeah. Yeah. This is an this is a overview, a partial overview of the uh, some some stones at the Dunkard Cemetery north of Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and the well, we'll see them. Many of these are Newmans, and I'm a big believer in. Even if you're not looking at the neighbors, which you should, taking overview shots of the cemetery to keep your perspective yeah. so you know, you know, these are these stones are roughly in rows. There are some that are not because some may be your headstones and some are footstones. But um, so I took this overview picture and I like to take a lot of pictures. This is the first stone. And if, if Shamel's got them in the order, I, I sent them to her. This is that first stone. It's very difficult to read. And when I went here, this was kind of on a whim. I went to the cemetery. So I didn't do some of the prep work that a person might do to get as a, a good of a picture of the stones as you could. Some of these are also on find a grave. There may be better images, but the, Part of the reason for going was to take the overview pictures to get a feel for how all these relative these graves are positioned in the cemetery because that wasn't on on find a grave. This I think is a wife of one of the uh, one of the Newman men. That's the one on the on the left. If we go to the next slide, this is my Ooh. fourth fourth great grandmother who died in eighteen sixty seven. Um, it's a pretty good. It's pretty legible for you know for for as old as that is. Um, and the way I, it's, it looks like it's standing up straight in that picture. Cause I was laying on the ground. And I, the, <laughs> I was doing this kind of a thing when I got that, when I got that shot, but that's the second one, which was fairly legible. And then there's the next one, which is Mahela wife of, I think wife of the dude who's buried next to her. Um, and then I, again, when I took some of the, and I'm the ones I'm including here, I've got close-ups. But I kept taking, as you can see, there's the background to help me yeah. keep. Because if I just take one overview and then a bunch of crop images, it makes it very difficult to see where these fit. 
So I did take some cropped ones, but this was one of the backed up ones because you can see that stone with the dead bush by it and on the left. Yes, that yes. helped me to keep my perspective. And I kind of did that. I liked the fact there was that thing there because it kind of served as an unofficial marker for where I was at. Like meets and bounds. You like the right. oak tree. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And you know, I so here's the next one. And the nice thing about David Stone is he was in the Civil War. There's a flag that helps me. I, it also was round on the ground, which made it more <laughs> distinguishable from the others. But it just gave me some perspective. And you can see there's a stone in the back in the back of that one. And I think there should be one more. I think I got us, I got the stone to I the, you had a lot the, more than one more. Yeah. And then it goes to the row, to the row back. And so this okay. is that one that's next to him that I really had trouble reading, but I yeah. got a picture of it. I've got to do some, some work on that. This is the, the big one, the big one on the, in the background there with, with the, the bush, with the bush next to it. Um, and then, as you can see, there's a stone leaning up. You can't really see that in the overview picture. But there's a the stone yeah. leaning up on the left there, and I think that's the next picture, if memory, um, if memory oh, serves. Oh yeah, really and so cool. I've got, I, you know, just, and again, you want to take a lot of pictures, so you, you know, close-ups are great, but you got to have those backup, backed-up shots, so you kind of know where you're at. And then I apparently forgot to crop out all the white on this image. Yeah, I was wondering, um, like, what is going yeah, on? Yeah, I, I was, it was kind of, yeah, I forgot to crop that out there. Um, that this is another larger, larger, more modern stone, and there's two small ones that are I next to it. You those. can't, you can't see it in this image because it's it's backed up so much. But the one that's kind of poking out of the ground, yeah, somebody had put a plastic flower on it, which I kind of liked. <laughs> because it, it helped me to distinguish it. So that might yes. be another little trick when you're going. And then here's a, a close up of that. It must have broken off. The top must have broken off. Oh, it's, yeah. It's put down beneath it there. But this is a wife of, I think, the guy that was the stone we just saw. But, you know, if you've got no marker, like we've got the bush and we've got this, the flower and the flag, you might even want to take something you can use yourself, like to. Like take a few of those flags they used to mark your water lines or your power lines in your yard. Oh, take put a few, them out you know, there. and use and don't leave them there. I'm not saying leave them there or <laughs> put some flowers or something, but that can serve as a kind of you, to mark your spot. So you, you, you see that little flag in several pictures, you know where you're at because they can kind of look the same if you're not if you're not careful. And then this is that stone again with the one next to it because that one in the ground is really hard to see so i wanted to know where that stone was at in and relationship yeah in relationship to the others and this is my uh michael a daughter of uh one of the other one of the other newmans but you want to get those pictures get your background shots and then of course these are all people now in this case was obvious they were probably related because they all have the same last name of newman okay i okay. mean that's just that you know you got to use your genealogy common sense there you know same last name they're buried together hmm i wonder <laughs> you know but if they're you still want to get that even if they're not take those you know you don't have to go crazy and take 300 pictures but get those surrounding stones uh of those individuals when you are there and get those background shots and to help keep perspective if there's not the markers like we we saw in those pictures take some flags take a couple sprays of flowers or whatever and put them on a few grays so then you've got that perspective in your photographs one last thing do you create tables uh, spreadsheets or list of the headstones I, I would put them in a table or a spreadsheet. Also, what I would do is I would draw out a map, the stones that I was working on, the people that we talked about researching a little bit to see if they are relatives. I would create a map of the relative positions of those stones. And if you've taken an adequate number of pictures, making that map shouldn't be that big. And it doesn't have to be precisely perfect. You're not doing right. surveying work. You're just wanting to get the relative positions of these of these stones all right let's get through these steps guys that was fantastic the steps for here comes the eternal neighborhood step one pick a burial just one start off with one 
Step two, determine the type of cemetery. Step three, track burials with a one to two stone radius. Step four, take pictures of the headstones. And step five, perform quick research on these neighbors. And we had some amazing ideas on how to take these pictures, amazing thoughts and analysis, Jim, on figuring out that wooden headstone. Very cool work, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's get ready for our second quick start. All right, he is here. We have wanted Jerry on for a while and I'm just so excited to have him come here to talk about land and just the amazing work that he does analyzing and just mapping out these this land stuff. And Jerry is all over the Institute. You're gonna fall in love with him. So I'm just telling you, Go hang out with him at the Institute. Let me just bring him on right now before I keep gushing. Welcome, Jerry Smith CG. How are oh, you, Jerry? I'm good. Thanks for having me. And I'm going to have to work to live up to the gushing reputation you just No, gave Jerry, you know you're my guy. You know you're my guy. I came, I would always come to PA to uh, listen to um, all the different techniques and strategies that you share. So Jerry, before we get started, we want to ask you what we ask all of our special guests. We want to hear your genealogy origin story, how you your one minute genealogy origin story, how you got started and when you knew you were hooked. Um, I grew up listening to my parents talk about their research and it often bored me silly. My father died relatively young, and at one point, my mother says, get this file cabinet out of my house. It's your genealogy, not mine. And I guess process of osmosis, I knew where one of his big brick walls was. It was in our male surname, Smith surname line. Um, decided to work on it a little bit and broke through it, and that's when I was hooked. Oh, so you broke through. I love it. Yeah, it's a good vibe. Good work sticks you to it. So fantastic on your mom for getting you. Yeah. <laughs> it on you. <laughs> was she excited about your breakthrough? Uh, she was pleased. Okay. <laughs> I think excited. It wasn't her line. <laughs> Very cool. So Jerry, Thanks again for being here. And let's jump right into your quick start, um, which is, it's coming, maybe. Did I click it? All right. Oh, my goodness. There it is. Building a neighborhood to show migration. Jerry, are you a Muppet fan? <laughs> Used to be. So which Muppet are you? Because you're talking about neighborhoods. So which Muppet are you, Jerry? Never mind the neighborhoods. Can I be the Swedish chef? <laughs> okay, you could be the Swedish chef. I forgot about the Swedish chef. All right, Jerry. So let's get started with this quick start. And it is, let's look at step one, which is to obtain the deed. So Jerry, just for everyone's, you know, level setting, where do you actually get the deeds? And how do you go about that? In most jurisdictions, your deeds are kept at the county courthouses. Now, in New England, they do things on a town basis, but again, it's a local entity um, is going to keep your land records. Now, you'll run the deeds back in the county courthouse and you'll reach a point where somebody has the land, but you can't figure out where they got it from. That's because if you're in, say, generally the, the original 13 colonies, they probably got it from a proprietor, like the Pens in Pennsylvania. Yes. Or if you're further west, they might have gotten it from the U.S. land office. So there's that initial grant from a governing authority to the first private owner. Those will not be your county level records. Those will either be federal records or state records. But in general, we're starting at the county. And where can you get, can you access these deeds online? For many counties, you can. 
Some of them you can get through Family Search. They've um, filmed the deed books. They're Ooh, up. Ooh, Family Search. Let's give Family Search some love on those deeds. It is so some, amazing. Some counties have made them available free of charge, particularly the historical ones. And very often, other counties, there's a subscription deed lookup service you can subscribe to. And a lot of those, you can go in and do your searches, and then you pay 50 cents a dollar a page for, for what you want. Okay, so we're going to obtain the deed most often at the county until we work our way back until the original stuff is happening. And then step two is to place the deed on a modern map. Now, Jerry, how do you do that? Well, usually to do that, you can't take an individual deed and place it on the map. You very often have to construct a neighborhood. You have to take that deed read the deed, find out who the neighbors are, look at their deeds. And then there's a process called land platting where you take the boundary description from the land document and you draw it. And you put all the drawings together. And I like to say, you just keep spiraling out until one of those deeds mentions something and you know where that is on a modern map. So that something could be like, you know, like a river or- A, a river, creek. a spring, a road local landmark. Okay, so we're getting we're getting a deed and we are pulling out the land descriptions and are there is there software that you can use to there's plot that? there's two packages that are popular with with genealogists. Um, one is called Deed Mapper and Google Direct Line software you'll find the website. The other one is called Meets and Bounds. And there's a free version of that one you can download. Um, they're both good. Take your pick. All right. All so right. With, with pencil and paper. And I would refer people to the first quarter of this year, NGS Magazine, if they want to learn how to do that. Okay. Check out NGS Magazine. So we are placing the deed on a modern map. And so step three would then be to locate the neighbor. So you kind of talked about that, where you get your deed, and how do you know who the neighbors are? More modern deeds, recent deeds, will probably tell you that a particular property line runs along Mr. Fox's property or Mr. Nash's property. Um, if you go back far enough, there's a lot of interest in who the first private owners were and some local historical societies and sometimes even state archives have those maps already done for you and you can find out who the neighbors were. Okay, so you can locate the neighbors either directly from the deed and there's other ways. In maps, I, I've, I looked out and found some maps for the time period that I was researching that had land owners on the map. Have you, um, there's this software out there called History Geo. It's a subscription. History Geo, yep. They give you maps of landowners, help you locate the neighbors. Um, it was popular in the late 1800s for publishers to publish landowner maps. Yes. Uh, you won't find boundaries on those, but you'll find, you know, the little squares for the buildings and, and names of the various people who live there. So I have a weird question, Jerry. So, you know, back when you're looking at these old late 1800 um, maps and they have like, you know, the person had like a large, you know, maybe 10 acres or whatever. And then they have the little black dot. How accurate is that black dot? Like I have a situation where the black dot is totally like on the complete other side of the property than where we know that house to have been or that structure to have been? It really depends on the map maker. Hopkins. I've overlaid some of those on Google Earth and they're incredibly accurate. Okay. Keep in mind that the larger the area the map covers, the more the curvature of the earth is going to distort an overlay like that. Okay. Okay. Also allow for the fact that a road may have moved the dwelling that's on the map may be a previous dwelling that you're not aware of, you know, an old log cabin or something like that. Okay. Things do change a little bit too. Okay. Okay. So we locate the neighbors and then step four is to plat 
the neighbor's deeds. So we're again going to use either like meets and bounds or a deed mapper to plat. To get a picture meets. of the neighborhood. Okay. Okay. And we're, we have some, some great images to share after we do our last step, after you plaque the deeds, excuse me, plat the deeds. And then you're going to go ahead and research those neighbors. And Jerry found out some really cool stuff. So let's take a look at your slide. Well, and, and keep in mind that the reason you do this yes. is the further back you go, People didn't migrate individually. They migrated in groups and they migrated with family members and people they were closely associated with. So that's, that's the cluster research. This. So this is a strategy of cluster research using yes. the deeds. Okay. So let's take a look at your slides. So what's our, this is talking about the background of our case. Tell us about it, Jerry. Okay. So this is going back on my Smith line. Um, and we're back to an individual named Frederick Smith or Schmidt. And why do I use both names? Well, we'll see. The answer is in a land record. And he died 1785 in Franklin County, Pennsylvania, which is, call it South Central Pennsylvania. And the question here is, where had his family come from? And we knew from our land record research that um, he didn't buy land from another local landowner. He got it from the Penn proprietors. He applied for it in 1765, and he lived there until his death 20 years later. So that's our background. Okay. Um, I put this in here just to show how rich uh, land documents can be. When he applied for his land and was given the land, he didn't have the money to pay for it, so he took out a mortgage from the Penns. This is a little bit different land document, but it illustrates something important. Um, the two insets that are blown up on the right, the upper one is from the upper portion of the document where it's saying it's an agreement between the pens, and you'll see there the pens between Frederick Smith, S-M-I-T-H. Mm -hmm. The lower inset is his signature at the bottom where he has signed his name in German script mm -hmm. as Frederick Schmidt. So this is my bridge document at the point where the family anglicized the name. You go back further than this, you're dealing with Schmitz. More recent, you're dealing with Smiths. Very so Documents can be unexpectedly rich in ways like this. Yes, if you go beyond just what you're looking for and take it all in. Talk to us about this, Jerry. Um, this is, in Pennsylvania, you would call it a patent. It's really the very first deed. It is the pens giving full title to this piece of land to Frederick Smith or Friedrich Schmidt. Um, and the patent is there. Where you see the underline, I don't expect that you'll be able to read it, but that's the, that's the beginning of the boundary description. You might be able to make out the word at the very left of that line, beginning. Beginning. And it'll say beginning at a hickory grub, and then it goes in a certain direction, a certain distance along a certain neighbor's property. Mm -hmm. Circles there are the names of the neighbors. Oh, so here we're pulling them out. Gotcha. Okay, so we can pull them right out of the boundary description. Over to the right is a drawing or a plot of his land that was made from that boundary description. So to build my neighborhood, I just picked one of those neighbors and I pulled their land document, and then I drew their land and figured out how it attached to Frederick's, et cetera, et cetera. So go on to the next slide. And you'll see the light purple lines there. That was the neighborhood that I mapped out. Over towards the right-hand side of that slide, you might be able to make out the letters Falling Spring. Um, that's a water feature. It exists today. And it was referenced in one of the uh, land documents that I used to make the map. Um, with this map, our Frederick Smith winds up down there in the lower left-hand corner. And I have put in the names of three of his neighbors. The dates that you see there are the dates that these individuals applied to the pens for their land. In other words, the dates they showed up. Mm -hmm. in Franklin County. Um, 
We knew from local records already that one of Frederick Smith's daughters married a son of Frederick Kraft. <laughs> Another of his daughters married a son of Adam George. It's always like that, Jerry. It's the same with my family. As soon as my mm -hmm. great, great, great died, my ancestor married the lady right across the boundary there. <laughs> yeah. Now you might say, well, yeah, they're, they're close. So, you know, the boys and girls that live next door are getting married. Of course, there's nothing yeah. special about that. But the fact that these all showed up, all applied for the land within a year of each other. Yeah. And what I found was that those neighboring families had been much better researched than my Smiths. Oh. Nobody knew where the Smiths came from, but family files and other research that I then went and verified on my own, it turned out that it was asserted, and it turned out to be true, that all three of those neighbors came from Bucks County, Pennsylvania, and it had their oldest children baptized at Keller's Church in Bucks County. So, Jerry, back up. How did you go from this land deed to this church in Bucks County? Through the research of the neighbors. Okay, so you looked at okay. the neighbors' paperwork. So what's, what kind of particular stuff were you looking at for the neighbors? Well, at the, t at the, at the time, this was a lot of this was you know, pre-ancestry, so it was paper family files at the local his history and genealogy <laughs> center. <laughs> now, you know, go on to family search, go on to ancestry, see what's out there. I would say never use unsourced information, never use crowdsourced information, but look at it. And if it turns out to be right, it will really shorten your research time. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> if it turns out to be wrong, you can probably determine that pretty quickly, too. So what was this? Is this the record? Let's share this beautiful record. Yeah, so we go back to Keller's church. We knew who Frederick's children were. We knew from some of the local records like tombstones when they were born. And this is actually at Keller's church, the baptism record of his oldest daughter. Mm. And you'll see over there on the left, you know, forgive the, forgive the script, but it says Fried Schmidt yes. and his Frau Petronella. Mm. Um, because his wife predeceased him in Franklin County, we did not know his wife's name. Oh, so this is beautiful. If this, if this is our Friedrich Schmidt coming out of Keller's church, it matches the baptism date for his earliest daughter. And now we have an assertion that if we're right, his wife was named Petronella. Oh, this is beautiful. So can we go back to Franklin County and find something to support the assertion that his wife was Petronella. So go ahead to the next slide. And in the Grindstone Hill Lutheran Church, which was just off his property, we found Petronella. There's her stone, Nell Schmidt. No. It's right next to one of her daughters that married into the George family. <laughs> of course, it's easy to say, okay, Petronella is just shortened to Nell. If you read the second line, it says Schmidt in. It ends in I-N. That's a female suffix that is sometimes put on to names um, when people spoke uh, fluent German. That was a common practice. Ah. We, we bounced over to check the church records in Berks County. We thought we found the name of a wife. We went back to Franklin County and verified it. Um, there was one other daughter as well that had been baptized um, there in Bucks County before they moved out. All the timelines fit, all of the pieces fit. So oh now where the family came from. But it was because work had already been done on the neighbors that I verified that that's where the neighbors had come from. Oh my goodness. This is amazing. This is amazing. So what what like because so i've had that experience where you're researching these people and all of a sudden like I, you keep seeing the same church the same church the same church how have you would have how have you shared have you connected with any do you work in community with of uh, these other descendants from these other people or are you kind of doing this in a silo i have made contact from time to time yes 
And yes. I would say as a Smith, you need to have <laughs> <laughs> these types of strategies to help distinguish your Smith from others and to put them within community. Would you agree? Yeah, there's, nothing, there's nothing wrong with collaborating, but when you collaborate, you want to make sure that you're getting high quality evidence. High quality evidence. I love that stone. And I did not know about the I-N at the end. Is that like um, Asian when they say Suki-san, like her name is Suki and they add like that endearment? Well, that's, the that's sort of an honorific. This is more of a, a female suffix on the surname you'll sometimes see. Would that be on the name in uh, not just a headstone? Would that be within the documents as well? In certain German language documents, yes. Very interesting. Very interesting. Jerry, I love uh, how you do these deeds. So you actually are working on, is this the same county where you're doing your larger deed project? No. Um, I have an ongoing project in Bedford County, which is two counties over, um, where I am mapping out and creating a database of all of those first private owners, the people who acquired the land, well, early enough from the pens and after the revolution from the Commonwealth Land Office, um, because there are no maps like that for Bedford County. So there if were you're in Bedford County. Where people have created indexes and databases, but we don't have that there. Um, Frederick's son, Anthony, who I descend from, mm -hmm. left, Franklin County and wound up in Bedford. And that's where my original brick wall was, was where had Anthony come from? Okay. All right. Jerry, let us look at these steps for your neighborhood building exercise, which is to build a neighborhood to show migration. Step one is to obtain the deed, which of course we can get at the uh, county level hopefully maybe family search. Step two is to place the deed on a modern map, which is a little challenging. Um, I'm still needing help with that myself. Step three is to locate the neighbors. Jerry gave us tips on how to find them in the deed. Step four is to go ahead and plat the neighbor's deeds as well. Don't be selfish. Help out, look at, look at everybody. And step five is then to research those neighbors. And if there's something there, which usually there is, you will be like Jerry and you will find this huge, amazing migration clue. Jerry, anything else that you wanted to share on land or this particular case study? Um, not on this one in particular, but I'll just say that there's this American ethos about land the people went west for land. The people came over to this continent for land. Um, land records are complete and thorough prior to the keeping of civil registrations, your birth, marriages, and deaths. You can find lots of family information in land records. And if you trace your family back far enough and you happen to come from an ethnicity such as, say, Denmark, where the land records go back to the year 900, you could really open up a floodgate of research. So 900. off land records. I'm Danish now. Is Denmark <laughs> Danish? <laughs> I need a Danish um, ex uh, case study to practice on. That's amazing. <laughs> I would love to see those records. All right, let's bring Jim back. He is waiting. He was, hey, Jim, how are you? Land is lots and lots of fun. I want to make sure you guys know about Roots and Branches. Oh, that's genealogy tip of the day. Here's Roots and Branches for Jim's um, column, weekly column. Jim, thank you for publishing that. Jerry, thank you so much for being here. Thank you guys for watching. And um, that's a wrap on those quick starts. Go check out the neighbors. They're waiting for you. All righty. Thank you, Jerry. Don't drop. <laughs>